and thanks for joining us today. Um, so we are all from the Academic Support and Access Center and the Writing Lab. Um, and so today's um, panel is going to talk a little bit about some of the writing challenges that our international students and our um, students with special needs or learning disabilities face. Um, so we're going to focus on um, some of those challenges and what those students experience in the classroom and then um, go through some ways that we at the Writing Lab work to support those students. Uh, and then we're going to provide some strategies that we think will make the writing process a little bit less frustrating for both students and faculty alike um, and ways that you as faculty can support those students um, in improving their writing and, and becoming confident writers both in and outside the classroom. Um, so we're just going to start off by briefly introducing ourselves and then we're going to jump into uh, an activity. My name is Emma Fawcett. Um, I work as a writing lab counselor. I've been there for it's about two years now um, and I'm also working on my dissertation at SIS. I'm Jordan Brand. I'm also a writing counselor at the Writing Lab. I'm, I'm in my sixth year as a graduate student in the history department, working on my dissertation. And I, uh, I guess I'll be talking mostly about international students today. Hi, I'm Nancy Tidner Greenberg. I'm the coordinator of the Learning Services Program in the Academic Support and Access Center. Um, the Learning Services Program is a small program of freshmen with diagnosed learning disabilities. Um, and it's a little unique among learning disability programs around the country in that it is only focused on students with language-based learning disabilities. So everybody in the program has a history of struggling with writing. Um, and um, the students in the learning services program are in a regular section of the college writing class. So we in the program are used to working with the college writing um, professors and with John Hyman. Um, so that's what we do, and I've been at AU about 10 years, and the very first year I was at AU, I worked in the writing lab um, as a counselor and um, certainly had some exposure to working with international students, but not as much as Jordan and Emma. And you'll see in your program today that um, Ira, who's the um, head of our writing lab and runs several other programs over at the ASAC, um, was also supposed to be here today. Unfortunately, she's out sick, um, but you can be assured that her expertise is infused through um, many of today's activities. So uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into our first activity. Uh, does anybody need, oh, I think it's cut off the very top line. Does anyone need either scrap paper or a pen? We're just going to do a brief writing exercise. I have paper. Yeah. There you go. Uh, thank you so much. Well, what else? And this will paper be later on the blackboard. We'll upload that. Will this be up uh, after the presentation on blackboard? Sure, blackboard? we can upload it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. So it looks like our projector cut off the very first line, but um, write a story based on the photograph below. Limit yourself to three or four sentences, about a hundred words. Um, and as you write, you want to keep these rules in mind. Um, so place the three words with which you want to begin each sentence at the end of that sentence without otherwise changing the word order. Use O-N in place of A-N and A-N in place of O-N wherever you write those letter combinations, either within words or alone. Uh, place your concluding sentence at the top of the page. And without otherwise changing the spelling, place the letter H to the right of the letter T in all words that begin with a T, and to the left of the letter T in all words that end with T. So we're going to give you about four minutes or so to do this exercise, and you can get started now.
About another 30 seconds to wrap up your little story. So how did you do? I'm sorry? I got to decide. Okay. <laughs> okay. Was there a particular role that seemed the most difficult or disoriented? Did the story you were able to write resemble in any way what you had in your head maybe when you first saw the picture? I felt very driven to simplify what I was thinking to write, to try to make it easier on myself when I had to redo it again, to avoid writing certain words. How did you feel as you were writing? <laughs> You're shaking your head. <laughs> Very frustrating, right? Yeah. So this exercise, um, kind of a, a fun activity, but it also um, helps to capture some of the frustrations that um, students with learning disabilities and also our international students to some extent experience when they're working on their writing assignments. Um, they often feel like they're forced to comply with these rules that are very arbitrary um, and that really impedes their writing process. Um, many, of the time, many of the times they um, have these great ideas but they never actually make it to the paper because they're so stunted by the process um, and spend so much time editing that what actually winds up on the paper is um, far less sophisticated than the thought that they had initially. So hopefully this um, reflects a little bit of that experience and, and helps you sort of put um, the rest of today's conversation in perspective. Uh, we're going to move on to a um, overview of what our writing lab does, just so you can sort of be oriented with, with our services. We're located right here in MGC, um, just around the corner. Um, and you have our hours here, and our students can make appointments um, online. Um, writing counselors help with every stage of the writing process, so we work with students everywhere from um, brainstorming to drafting thesis statements to outlining arguments, um, recognizing recurrent patterns of grammatical error that they might be dealing with, um, and then when they actually have finished drafts, we also work with them on creating smooth prose, um, putting transitions into their paragraphs, that sort of thing. Um, all of our counselors have specific skills um, for working with international students and also students with learning disabilities. So we're a mixture of graduate students and also professional writers. Um, and while we help any student who's here at AU, um, those, that, those two populations tend to really be our, our bread and butter um, because we are located within the ASAC. Um, so as experienced counselors, we evaluate drafts, we identify areas for improvement, um, we explain different strategies that students might be able to use, um, although we don't provide proofreading or editing services, um, so students don't sort of drop off a paper and then come back to get it 45 minutes later with all the corrections made. It's a collaborative process. We sit down together and work through um, papers with students. 
um, and we're focused on helping them become better writers over the long term. So many students have regular appointments with us and they continue to see us um, throughout the semester and even throughout their years here at AU. Um, and as I said, any student who's enrolled here, whether they're part-time or full-time, a graduate student, an undergraduate, um, anybody is eligible to use the Writing Lab. We even offer online sessions for some of our students who are enrolled in online programs or aren't otherwise able to make it here to campus. Um, so we try and meet the needs of as many of our students as possible. And I'll just add that the Writing Center and the Writing Lab are two separate offices within the university. We provide very similar service working with students I'd say the only major difference is that we have some additional training to work with international students and students with learning disabilities. And we, most of the student, uh, the counselors in the Writing Center are um, from the English department, while we have a few other um, different departments that we are from. Um, so as we get started, we thought it would be useful just to kind of talk through what an ordinary session looks like at the Writing Lab, just so if you have students or um, colleagues who are coming to the Writing Lab, if you have an experience with yourself, um, just get a sense of what we do every day. Um, so for most sessions, we start by trying to get to know the student. That's usually the first few minutes. It's really helpful to get to know the um, student's background, where they're from, um, also, just to find out kind of their interest in their major, because an economic student is going to write a very different literature paper than a peer. Um, from that point, once we have a rapport, we try to work with the student to identify actual goals for the se session, and we often write them down at the very beginning. It's 45 minutes is a very brief time, and uh, it's easy to kind of creep into other topics if you don't kind of label things at the beginning. Most students come to the Rang Lab uh, interested in grammar. Uh, we have an online appointment system, and I'd say for about half students, they will simply write something like check grammar um, at the beginning of when they're writing the appointment of what the appointment's about. Um, once we actually get started, um, we as counselors generally try to push students um, towards what we think call higher order concerns, um, issues of organization, evidence, argument, and audience, um, over lower level concerns like grammar, style, spelling, punctuation, and presentation. And I can say, generally speaking, that um, regardless of a student's background, graduate or undergraduate, it is always the higher order concerns that are kind of the major issues in papers. It's very, very rare that I have a student who has a kind of clear argument on the page and just needs finesse. That's a very kind of rare set, um, session to just do. Um, one other thing we do before kind of diving into this session is that we always review the assignment guidelines. Um, if students have them in hard copy, we ask them to bring them out and we read them together to make sure the student has kind of an understanding of what's, what's been asked of them. If they don't have a copy of the assignment, we go online and we try to find it on Blackboard or on the course website. So if those are things that you've put time and resources into developing, these kind of online resources, students are using them. It's kind of a regular feature of what we do. Um, this is a thing, uh, this burns time that we can spend otherwise working, but it's a very useful time. Um, we want to make sure that the student's actually working on what matters. If a student comes in for a pre-draft appointment, something that where they don't have a hard copy of something for us to look at, we'll work with them to brainstorm and organize ideas. Um, for many students, I feel like it's kind of like a talking cure. You know, it's just having someone who's willing to ask questions and listen to them talk and is actually willing to kind of transcribe what's on their minds. Um, I found that many students at all levels um, don't have a good system yet when they come to the writing lab how to capture their ideas and get them out of their head in the initial part of their paper process. Now, if a student does have a draft, uh, and many students do, um, if it's my session, I usually say, like, why don't you go ahead and explain your paper to me out loud for the first minute or two, and I try to write down what they have, what, what their vision of the paper is at the start of the session, because I think many times that's the issue, is a student has a certain vision for the paper, but it hasn't appeared on the page yet. Um, but once that done, once that done, our typical process is to read the paper out loud. Um, it's up to the student kind of preference of how we go about working a session, but a lot of the sessions that we involve um, have us or the student kind of working through the paper, reading certain sections out loud to each other. Um, we just found that's kind of the, the most straightforward method for students being able to see their paper in a new light to recognize mistakes. Um, most international students, um, I end up reading the paper because it's easier for them to kind of hear changes in my intonation and voice and it takes, it uh, gives them a, a little bit of space so they don't have to feel like they have to perform in front of me during the session. 
Um, and then, if, um, as we go through the essay, the usual process that I follow with students is that as we look for stylistic or grammar issues, what they come here and look at, we create what I call a reverse outline. It's also referred to as a reverse sentence outline. And that's where I ask students to kind of reduce each paragraph down to a single declarative sentence. Um, this is a way of kind of checking for clarity of thought with the student. And for them to, in the um, process of a 45 minute session, to kind of reduce their paper down to like a platonic ideal. And they can see at a glance on a, like a single sheet of paper how their argument or how their thinking stacks up. In a 45 minute session, um, we can usually work through about five pages. So that's something to keep in mind that if you have students coming in with these papers, that that's kind of the realm that they can do in about a 45 minute session with the Rank Council. And as a point we're going to be returning to, I think, throughout this presentation, um, while international students and students with learning disabilities have specific needs, the major issues for all students are, I'd say, across the board, very similar. And I think, Nancy, are you going to continue? I think it's you next. So next we're going to give some, some good ideas that we think faculty can implement um, to make this process easy, easier both on, on yourselves and on your students. Um, the first one, which sounds like a no-brainer, although you might be surprised how um, much our students struggle with this, um, is providing clear assignment guidelines and encouraging your students to build an outline from those guidelines. A lot of students think that the directions that you put on your assignment sheets or on your syllabus are suggestions um, or sort of nice ideas, but not things that they necessarily need to, to live by when they're writing their papers. Um, so putting all of those um, instructions in one location, whether it's a, a folder on Blackboard or a section of your syllabus um, is really helpful, especially for students with organizational challenges. Um, we have quite a few appointments where we ask the student for the assignment sheet and they're not entirely sure where to find it. So um, if there can be a streamlined location that's definitely very helpful. Um, and in your actual um, assignment guidelines, it's helpful to be as explicit as possible. So um, if you have, um, for a midterm paper, um, you know, a section where you want them to have an introduction, a historical background, um, and then several sections of content, Many of our students benefit from knowing precisely how much of that 10-page paper should be allocated to each of those sections. So if you can suggest to them two-paragraph introduction, four paragraphs on history, whatever it might be, um, and then we can actually help them build an, a comprehensive outline from those guidelines. So they're taking that assignment sheet and transferring it into something that they can actually build their paper from. Um, and if you have specifics on a style manual that students should be using um, and the number of sources that are required, um, sometimes those guidelines are given verbally in class but not, aren't actually on the assignment sheet and it's especially helpful if they're all sort of in one location and then if your student is getting help from people other than you, um, we can kind of reinforce that. Many of our students also benefit from rubrics, so knowing exactly what an A paper, a B paper, a C paper looks like for your particular assignment um, and what your criteria is, is for grading so that they can ensure that they're doing their best to meet that criteria in their finished product. Uh, we also like to encourage students to write multiple drafts. So one of the questions we tend to get most frequently in, in sessions from students is, how can I become a better writer? How can I make this easier? How can I... Um, stop coming here. <laughs> um, and so one of the answers we usually give is that it's practice. So um, as you're all writers yourselves, you know that you, you get better at it by, by continuing to do it and by continuing to get feedback and implementing that feedback. Um, so if you can give your assignments as early as possible, encourage your students to form peer edit groups, to meet you during office hours, to come and see us, to come and see the writing center. Um, that's all good ways for them to get that additional practice and improve their writing over the course of the semester. Um, also remember that for international students and those with learning disabilities, class assignments can take two or three, three times longer than you might expect. Um, and so giving students as much notice as possible about their assignments is really helpful in enabling them to manage their workload. Um, at the center, we also offer, there's um, counselors who also work with students on um, time management um, and on other organizational strategies. Um, and so that's another, another component of our work. And so having as much advance notice as possible can really help them. Um, this is especially true for international students for whom um, elements of US culture or history may be um, 
literally completely foreign to them. Um, I had a student who was doing an assignment on the Affordable Health Care Act and the mysteries of the U.S. health insurance and health care system were just um, completely foreign to her. And so what would have been an easy short answer assignment for other students in the class required a great deal of background research for her. Um, that's just one example. We have other students who sometimes get film assignments and they have to choose a classic film from each decade in the United States. For those students, that sort of film selection is um, you know, even longer than the paper writing process itself. Um, so if possible, also try and avoid surprise assignments because they can completely derail um, some of those students in, um, in their preparations and the, the plans they've made to stay on track. Uh, providing clear feedback is also really critical. So many of our students struggle to read handwriting um, or to decipher abbreviations. So if you can type your comments, that's especially helpful for them. If you use particular correction marks, giving your students um, a proofreading or correction sheet at the beginning of the semester. Um, the bane of many of our students and their feedback is AWK, A-W-K. Do any of you use AWK on your papers? <laughs> I spell it out. Um, <laughs> So for a lot of them, they don't know um, what you mean by an awkward sentence. Um, so giving them sort of a, even selecting a couple sentences and rewriting them in a way that would be clearer, or even discussing with them verbally what they actually meant by that particular sentence. Um, but telling them something is awkward or lacking in clarity, um, quite frankly, lacks clarity. So <laughs> they don't necessarily know what you mean by that. Yeah. I had a student once tell me that they was anonymous. I'm sorry? They. Uh huh. It was, that was not a comment that was meaningful because the comment was meaningful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yes. Um, in that same category as awk and unclear. <laughs> um, and the last point we just wanted to make here was encouraging your students to um, go to your office hours, particularly for international students. The idea of sitting down with a faculty member and asking questions about the material is incredibly daunting. Um, many of them might feel that asking questions of a faculty member um, is presumptuous. Um, it might indicate that they are poorly prepared. Um, they might think that if they sat with their textbook longer, the answers would come to them. Um, so they're very uncomfortable about making that first move. So if you can try and encourage that as much as possible, um, it can help with it. And then um, Nancy's going to talk about some of the bad ideas uh, for supporting students with their writing challenges. Hi. Um, I'm going to start off by reinforcing something positive because I'm always telling my students not to write emails to professors with negative <laughs> words in them. So I, I always feel a little funny saying something negative. Um, I'd like to reinforce, um, I work with students on all sorts of college level academic skills, but I think the vast majority of what I work on is papers across the curriculum here at AU. And I can say the two biggest things I see are um, students just not realizing, and, mo and I mostly work with freshmen, so I think this is just a transition issue for all freshmen, is that they really are supposed to be doing in a paper what you as faculty want them to do in a particular paper. They often don't realize they don't have to invent <laughs> what they've got to do. They, they, so, Anything um, I think you can do to really just to emphasize, these are my guidelines for the paper, this is what I'm expecting. Um, if I found students also find a rubric really helpful, you know, what's an A for this particular paper? What's a B, what's a C, and on, on down. Um, and I think um, that rubric can even include you know, part of what I expect is a clean paper that's been proved and edited. You know, part of what I expect, um, if it's a research paper, is, you know, X number of sources and what types of sources. Um, and I think the other thing, too, is um, just the understanding at this point in life, what their writing is really a process in college. And I think that's really the time factor involved in that is really a challenge for students with um, any type of disability that impacts their learning, whether it's a learning disability or attention deficit disorder. And, and we do serve hundreds of students in the Academic Support and Access Center um, with learning issues. And I think we at AU probably serve many more than that who aren't documented here because there are so many more college students these days with, with learning issues. Um, 
and so I think, you know, it does take them longer um, to write, and so the more focused they can be from the beginning, the better it is, I think, for the people on the other end grading the papers, but for the students who are writing them. Um, so here's to some of the don'ts. Um, don't make writing, coming to the writing lab mandatory or offer extra credits for appointments. We've actually, I think, had that happen. Um, yeah. And um, we, the writing lab is actually quite popular. It fills up, appointments fill up quickly. Um, and we don't have, unfortunately, endless time or space, so um, we can't do that. I would say, though, a do, a positive thing would be to mention the writing lab in your syllabus, if you can. Um, and I would just like to make sure everybody is aware, too, that the ASAC, um, for now a couple of years, has been one office. We're no longer a second, separate academic support center and a separate disability services support. I've noticed some people have still have two offices in, in their syllabus. Um, but if anybody needs information on that from us, we, will, we can send you the links to everything. Um, don't tell students that we proofread. We aren't a proofreading service, but um, we will help them to recognize patterns in grammatical mistakes, and we'll, we, we will point out proofreading issues to them um, and read back to them what they've got, and they will often say, no, no, that's not what I meant. I, I will say um, dyslexia is the learning disability where we see, you know, people typically see the most um, spelling errors, and dyslexia is the most common learning disability. Um, and there's a significant amount of population in the United States that has dyslexia, so, and there, I think, are a fair number of dyslexic people here at AU. We will work with students if they come to us um, to help them with assistive technology that can take care of a lot of the proofing issues for them. Um, and we do have an assistive technology specialist on staff at AU um, who we can refer students to, um, who's in our office. Um, another don't is don't assume that all students understand plagiarism. I think we have all seen um, this be a really confusing issue for international students. I think the cultural expectations are different, I think, um, for international students, and Jordan can talk to this much better than I can. Um, it's, it's the, the, what we expect in terms of documentation is often very new for some international students. I can tell you for students with learning issues, um, I think for anyone with, a, anyone with a learning issue has some organizational challenges in some ways, and um, Writing a research paper is a huge tax on someone's organizational, higher level organizational abilities. Um, and so I think it is a group of, of students who are very prone to accidents um, with academic integrity. Um, and so I think the more clear the expectations around that, the more helpful it is for them. Um, and we certainly work with students on all sorts of citation generators so that they can get the, the more um, cosmetic part of um, that task done more efficiently so that they can do the higher level part of it and learn the higher, spend more time learning the higher level part of it. Um, don't assume that all students understand how to build a thesis-driven argument. Um, for international students, the thesis can sometimes belong in the conclusion. Um, or the introduction is often supposed to be a long, felt, flowerly, broadly connecting item. Um, I think for students with learning disability, I think for freshmen in college, um, a thesis statement at the college level is a complex organizational um, issue. Um, and then when grading assignments, um, we have seen students be sort of overwhelmed when every single thing is corrected on the on a on a paper, um, one thing I have seen professors do um, on the on the beginning end of um, paper assignments that I think has been really helpful is 
um, to give the students a prototype of a like, paper. If it's a paper that they've assigned in a past semester or past year to hand out a previous paper where they've um, they've made it anonymous, they've blanked out the past student's name and identification information, but it's an A paper and that really helps. Yeah, sure. One of the questions I've had is that I would like to give them a template. Students have asked, can you show me an example of that paper? And do I need permission of the student uh, who wrote that paper? I, I can make an anonymous pick up the name, but do I have to ask them permission to allow them uh, that I, I can use that paper or can I just do it? I don't know what the rules are when it concerns that. Does anybody know? I believe you do. I, I yeah. believe you need permission from the student. That's what I that thought that, because it is their product, yeah. so I, I thought it, you know, you can't just take it, so, because I'd like to do it, but I want mm -hmm. to know what the particular process is. You know, I've seen it done in the, um, with the college writing professors that are, work with the students in our program, and we've had the same professors teaching for a few years, and I think one way they have made it efficient for them is when they have an A paper in college writing, which doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> um, they will sometimes say to the student, this was just so great, you know, is it okay with you if I use this next year? Um, Do I need to uh, have it written, a permission, or just a verbal? Okay. Again, I don't want to get you up on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm actually not sure. In my in my own experience, I've had professors who actually use email, and that is kind of a as long as it's okay. an agreement, some sort of record for that sort of thing. That's a good idea. Thank you. Is that all of yours? Yeah. Um, did you want me to? Um, and then, or do you want to do question yeah, and answer? We'll do Q so we sort of started this already, um, but now we wanted to um, take some of your questions and see what other challenges um, you're facing in supporting students with their writing and uh, see if there's any other advice or, or ideas we can share in the room. You have a question? Yeah. Uh, a few of my students I've run into problems with, they have tried to phrase things, international students, they've tried to phrase things in English that are phrases that are not directly translatable or words that are not directly translatable. Do you have any strategies or tips to um, help international students with phraseology, uh, even if you don't speak the language? Mm -hmm. So I find this is one of the idioms are really difficult yeah. for students and just kind of getting form language down. Um, for idioms, there really is no silver bullet for idioms, unfortunately, the students. It's, that is like something that is only learned over years of acculturation. And that sort of thing. I, I would say, I think both Adam and I are reminiscing that in the course of the semester, it's amazing how much students pick up and how much they grow in the course of the semester and how much they kind of become more um, comfortable in that sort of language. Um, now, that being said, giving students model papers or um, actually giving them kind of, I've, I've seen professors who give them kind of lists of like, this is how, if you want to say an art, uh, the professor or the author says this, if you need other words to kind of flesh that out. Here's a list of like good words, like contend, argue, that will kind of give them some things. Um, like a, a lot of this is kind of learning kind of academies, unfortunately, um, for better or for worse. It's just kind of how to frame these, these sentences together. But I think that the more that you as a professor can call attention to those things, either giving them separate sheets that say like these are common words that people can use in their papers or saying like we've read this article, let me call attention to this paragraph and how he puts together this kind of abstract idea on the page are two things that you can do to kind of help them get used to kind of this language a bit more. We also have in the lab and also on our website um, some handouts with um, good transition words, um, words to start concluding sentences, so some of those sort of, a lot of it is stock language that sounds very unnatural to you if you're a non-native English speaker. Um, you know, all of our howevers and in comparison and all those sorts of, of, of bridging words and phrases. So we, um, some of them are on our website and we can also give them out to students as well. Um, and a lot of times that helps them sort of expand the collection of words that they use. Um, you might see that they, um, an, a student will um, have a, a pet word that they know it works and it's grammatically correct, <laughs> so then they use it over and over and over again. So we can sort of help them expand some of those choices. And you can do that too, you know. Next time you, when you revise, you might consider one of these three or four other options instead. And I was going to say too, we do um, writing workshops, the Academic Support and Access Center, every semester. 
Um, the schedule is not up yet, although I think it's almost complete, so it'll be up soon. Um, and there are specific workshops for writing workshops for international students, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and my memory is those are pretty well attended. Yes. Um, so that might be something you, you know, suggest that your international students go to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you just mentioned the uh, workshops that was specifically intended for international students. Um, who conducts these workshops I and mean, who teaches the workshops? Like experts like uh, uh, Emma Jordan teaching them uh, organization structure, or you also engage some language. So usually it is our responsibility as writing counselors to actually run these workshops in a lot of ways. And um, I mean, in the past when I've taught the class, um, I basically started with things I've already put together for writing research papers in general, and then just tried to build in like things that are specifically tailored to students um, in this way. And I think in the past, unfortunately, I think we combined like some things like students with learning disabilities and international students and they're very distinct in the challenges they face. Um, but certain things do carry over, like the additional time that's required for assignments is very important um, for international students, and the use of peer group editing is something that more international students do. Um, so those things do carry over, but it's usually us. Um, what I mean is that, uh, for example, at WCL, there is a course uh, uh, within, the, within their um, international uh, Legal studies program mm -hmm. is intended for international students, uh, and it's English for English for lawyers. Okay. And there's also right. advanced legal writing course. Right. So and it's like there are two courses, and within the advanced legal course, legal writing course, they stream some of the course with structure, organization, and the English for uh, lawyers course teaches them more like language issues, plus some, you know, uh, skill, English language skill, like presentation, uh, summarizing, working with, uh, I don't know, case briefs and, and this stuff. Do you think that something like that might be useful, I mean, also at the undergraduate level? So those are, um, are they semester-long courses that the students enroll yeah, in? Yeah, they are the semester-long Okay, yeah, because there is that here in our undergraduate program as well for international students. There are um, like prepare, courses that prepare them to, uh, at the, for writing, that um, prepare them to take um, regular undergraduate courses in different majors that are with a mix of international and, and um, American students. And is there a college writing course for yeah. international yes. students? Yes. Yeah. Specifically yeah. targeted to like writing a complete right. research paper right. um, in English for the course of a semester. Yeah. So they do do that. Though I do think that's, that's outstanding that, that there is this course at WCO. Because um, I was just thinking like the metaphors like before the court was one that I had a student who did not, did not know that metaphor. And so we had to kind of talk about like these like strange idioms that pop up and legal arguments mm -hmm. so, so much. A lot of what our workshops focus on is um, strategy as well, rather than sort of the, the nuts and bolts of writing a research paper, but when you have this, um, you know, 25 page paper that you have to attack over the course of a semester, sort of where do you begin um, in, in the writing process, so they're, they focus as much on strategy, I think, as they do, because we only have them for two hours versus, you know, length of a semester. In your experience, what um, motivates students Fear of getting a bad grade, or um, really wanting to make progress. You know, in with most of the successful students that you've seen, you know, that you worked with over a longer term, I kind of have identified for myself where where this success comes from. I have to say, one of the things I'm consistently blown away with with the students that come to the writing lab is their drive and their motivation. Um, now granted, these students all self-select to come to the writing lab, right? They have to take it upon themselves to schedule the appointment. They don't get any academic credit for coming there. So maybe they're a, a subset of, of our um, undergraduate and graduate student populations. But by and large, I would say that they are really desperate to walk away 
um, as you know, with their diploma in hand, being capable of writing excellent papers and writing in a confident way um, in both populations, both our students with, with learning disabilities or learning issues and those with international students. I have students who say to me, I really want to, by the time I leave, be able to know that I can sit down at my desk at my job and write an email that no one's going to look at and think, what is she saying? I don't understand. So they really want to walk away with that sense that they can write with confidence. Yeah, I'd say across the board, it's, I, I, it's they, they work incredibly hard, the students that we get to work with, and I think that um, it's always, it's rarely to please a professor or to kind of a worry about failing, if that's motivating students. It's almost always a kind of desire to become better than what they were at the start of the semester or to actually complete something that's meaningful to them. And not to say that bad grades don't upset them. No, but not to say that we don't get some students who are just here and they're like, I just, I just need this paper to be okay. Right. But I'd say that the majority of students are actually not thinking about the paper level. They're thinking about, well, once I write this paper, I'm going to have a lifetime more, and I would like to be able to be like my writing to be unrecognizable or my writing to be outstanding. Yeah. I, I'm also trying to think about it from the other going the other way. because. Often I will get those international students, if I give them an exam, they'll come back and say, well, they just didn't understand my writing. <laughs> so is there a process where I don't know whether you or people who work in this area could look at some of those questions and say, that's going to give international students a hard time, the way you phrase that, the way you use it, with, or whatever it is. To, to give us some heads up in terms of avoiding that problem? Mm -hmm. Is that a service anybody's ever thought about? Or? Interesting. Yeah. I, well, the closest I can think is that I had a lot of students this past year who came with exams, who were international students. And I would say, you know, our, our policy is that if you've come in with any sort of exam or test or quiz or take home that we can recognize as such, we will only work with you if you have the written permission of your professor. And if you don't have it with you, that means that I will, I'm going to contact your professor as soon as the session is over with an email saying what we did in the session. And you know, if, if you don't have permission, there will be consequences from this, this appointment. And my students have all said, you know, I have permission. And when I kind of pressured the pressure, they said, oh, it's great that they came. Um, but that, I, I found, was a really useful time. Because in that, we're not working on the, the, their actual ideas or their actual responses to the questions so many as, as just saying, like, well, let's look at the question and make sure you do have, understand what's being asked of you in the exam period, if that makes sense. So we're, we're actually not checking the professor's work before the students see it. We're seeing it once the students have it on a case-by-case -case basis and kind of helping them once they interpret that. It or before they sometimes they have answers. Sometimes they have just kind of their notes. And we're saying, and we'll say, like, well, does this answer this, this third part here? Do you understand what the professor is asking you to do or mm -hmm. this large edition, that sort of thing? I don't know of anybody, maybe you do, Nancy, who works with faculty to sort of streamline assignment wording to make them more intelligible to kind of a broader yeah. audience. Sorry, was this on an essay test or? No, it's a, generally it's on, um, well, it's, I teach the television industry, so there's a lot of industry terms, and it's generally true, false, short answer kind of ah, questions. So, okay. You know, I think, yeah. We do work a lot with students on test-taking strategies. Um, and we do have some workshops on um, you know, preparing for exams. Um, and I wish more students attended them. Um, I have found myself in the past few years working much more often than I did when I came here 10 years ago. So I don't know what that really means. <laughs> on students who are really having a, t a tough time with um, true, false, multiple choice, and short answer. Um, the short answer is a little easier to educate people on, I think. Um, I find true, false, and multiple choices is hard for a lot of students. Um, and I do think we are seeing students here at ADU um, who are from a variety of maybe less prepared backgrounds than we used to. Um, so I don't know the easy answer to your question, but I certainly think um, you could encourage them to um, 
attend um, some of our study and foreign taking test workshops. But with that one, you know, it may be a study problem also. Um, and I think students though don't have necessarily good, you know, at the moment if they're taking the test, necessarily great test taking strategies either. Yeah. So there'd be a lot going on with that one. <laughs> And it's a hard thing to vet too, because if say you, if you said here I I made a if you made an appointment with yourself, the writing counselor won't know the jargon that the students have and effectively been learning yeah. throughout the semester in the course for that sort of thing. So it's kind of a hard thing to gauge. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of yeah. the question. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of students. Are you in the school of communications? Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of students struggle with some of their um, even their understanding media tests. Um, you know, particularly around multiple choice and three faults. Well, a lot of it's very cultural based. And yeah. It's also a common problem in philosophy exams, I found too, is sort of getting to what the question actually is, um, which is partially a product of the field, right? They tend to be kind of convoluted and abstract. So if you're from a background that really looks for concreteness, those can be difficult. And, you know, just this is separate from writing, although does involve writing on a test. We do have a tutor refer a course content um, tutor referral service run throughout the ASAC. So for a very nominal fee, a student could get a tutor for an individual course. We don't guarantee it, um, but you know that's another option if you see a student who's just really struggling with studying. Although you know, usually those are students who in the classroom appear pretty together and knowledgeable. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm just going to tag along here a little bit, which is the issue of like multiple choice questions. Even I had, and my first language is good in English, sometimes in a multiple choice question, the question itself can be difficult for the student to really know what the professor is asking. I don't know if necessarily the student only or the professor. Should, you know, sometimes we're trying to make it a little tricky, but in doing so, sometimes we complicate it. And you know, either use words or certain to make it more open-ended. What can we as teachers do relative to the questions to at least? make sure that we are asking and evaluating their understanding of the topic versus their understanding of the question. Mm -hmm. And so that's the question I have because I really am trying to evaluate them because I'll have a student say, that's what you really meant or gee, I, I, I thought this. Now sometimes if I have a consensus student, I just throw out the question and say, even if one student points out and says, gee, but to me I think Oh, it can be interpreted a different way. I never saw that before. I automatically build the question. Mm -hmm. But what can we do as professors to write questions in a way that we're really evaluating knowledge and understanding and not trying to just interpret the question itself? One of the things we were talking about earlier today, um, a lot of our students have challenges identifying what's the main question and then what are the sort of sub points that you want them to address because sometimes especially in longer prompts there'll be kind of a paragraph and there'll be lots of questions embedded in that um, or sometimes you'll start a sentence with a, a question that is um, discuss or describe or evaluate and there's a verb and a, a declarative sentence but there's no question mark at the end um, and I had had two students um, who are um, on the spectrum this semester, who um, it took us several attempts um, for this particular student to understand that just because it started with evaluate or discuss or a verb and had a period at the end of the sentence, it was still a question they needed to answer. So I think being as explicit as possible about what is kind of your descriptive framing of the question and what are the pieces they're actually supposed to answer. So sometimes putting them in an outline form, so your main question and then discuss A, B, and C. So then you're sort of embedding within your question the structure for how you want their answer to be um, helps you get at having them actually be able to write good responses rather than spending more of their time deciphering what it is you're actually getting at. Anything too, if you have particular recommendations for 
how you think they should study effectively or what you think they should study, pass that on to them. I've heard students express a lot of frustration over, you know, the professor didn't tell us how to study or what to study. Um, and, and I think they feel a little understandably lost um, for that. But I think if they got some guidelines, you know, almost like paper guidelines, um, I don't know how many people do consistent study guides. I've noticed some folks do and some don't. Um, but I've seen a lot of students do very well with study guides and I don't feel like it's, you know, I don't feel like it, I feel like it's at the college level, it's not, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's not high school. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good academic tool. Um, and it's interesting, I've seen a lot of online, I saw a lot of online things, um, this was in a, for one of the Kogod classes, um, one of my students in Business 1.0 was showing me practice quizzes that were, I think, from the textbook they were using. And it was multiple choice and true false. Um, and it was a great way, I thought, for the student to study. And it was just, I think it was part of their textbook package. Um, so, yeah, and I didn't think it was too elementary at all. It was a good study thing. I mean, I think for me, the uh, as an instructor, what I would recommend is that if you are doing multiple choice, and that's kind of the format, and maybe that that's a necessary format because of the size of the class or the kind of content, um, well, first confirm what the content is that you want students to learn. Because I feel like with a lot of multiple choice questions, it's almost like taking the SAT again, where you're learning rhetoric and how questions are formed to trick you, as opposed to the content that's actually shown for the question. And I know that part of the challenge of multiple choice is baked into kind of like which one of these, like there can be tricky language that's kind of part of the challenge, but I would say getting away from that as best as possible would be useful to make more straightforward multiple choice or alternatively to give students practice quizzes. Um, even something brief that's like here's three examples of a multiple choice questions. These are the kind of questions that will be on the exam. So you'll be more aware of them when you come in and talking through them and saying like you can see this question could could deceive you, or could be, if you don't read it closely, it's easy to misinterpret. So kind of getting them just a little bit of practice together before they actually take the real thing by themselves would be useful. That's also a good way to test drive wording, too. So then if you have it on a practice mm -hmm. test, you might, might give students an opportunity to say, when you phrase it this way, I'm, I'm lost. I don't know what to do with that question. And then you can revise it for future exams. We are almost out of time, but does anyone have a last question or two? Or tips, things that work yeah. for you as an instructor or professional? Okay, so we will wrap up with just an overview of um, some of the other services that we offer. Oh, yes. Writing workshops, as we mentioned. Yeah. Um, and we do do all sorts of um, study skills and academic skills workshops. We do study informed taking tests. Um, there's a variety of paper workshops. There's graduate research, there's undergraduate research, there's international students. I think there's just papers. Mm -hmm. just there's an academic integrity code there, workshop. There is, yes, an academic integrity code. Megan runs a successful student series of workshops that is um, sort of targeted towards freshmen and sophomores. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I must have forgotten a study skill somewhere in there. Um, but um, and again, they will, they're posted online and there are um, paper cards of the workshops at the front desk in the academic um, support center. Um, we do have individual academic counseling for any student, um, although certainly a large number of students that we see in the ASAC are, are students with disability, but any student at AU could come in for and for one-on-one -on -one academic counseling. Um, course content um, tutoring. There, there are selected courses that we are now have tutoring hours for um, in the room next to the ASAC, um, and those will be posted online. Uh, there are some of the more rigorous sciences, STEM fields in general. Yeah, yeah. almost all the maths, I think. Um, and um, But then there's also tutor referrals for other courses, and students can sign online tutor request form for those. 
Um, it is really a nominal fee. It's not much. Um, we are the office at AU um, for students with any type of disability. Um, if a student wants to document and get accommodations and access support, it is our office. Um, and assistive technology. We have an assistive technology person on staff. Um, assistive technology is things like Kurzweil and Dragon. Anybody heard of those around writing? They're great. Yeah. Um, she also works with blind students and hearing impaired students. Um, the person who, the, our full time person left uh, um, a while ago and becomes a, a consultant in the position now, um, who actually also has some training in using technology around time management um, and particularly on people with executive functioning issues. So she's always a very interesting resource around technology. It's not around technology in general. Um, so, um, and we do work a lot, I think, do you guys with citation generators? Mm -hmm. And certainly, um, I work a lot on just regular technology with students who aren't writing. Um, so just one thought to conclude today, and that's that a lot of the techniques and strategies that we use with international students and students with um, learning needs is that many of these also are, are good for all of your students. So um, clear guidelines and clear feedback, um, really thinking about um, the way in which you structure test questions and um, provide students with access to other resources. <laughs> <laughs> it benefits everyone in your classroom. Um, so you don't need to think about these as special things you're doing just for those two populations. They can really be of use to everybody. So thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>